Hi everyone, welcome back to this uh, tip video. Um, it's my second one <laughs> on the channel. Um, it's been about four months since I did the first one, so I thought it was about time I jumped back on and um, added a few things more to the list. Because I've, I've been com compiling this for a, a couple of weeks now, just things I've sort of noticed I think will be useful for other players. Um, in terms of who this is aimed at, I think it's going to be more useful to beginners. But again, there, there might be some things on here for intermediate and even the higher level players that might be worth being reminded of, you know, then they maybe have missed some of these little things. Um, so again, I think it's worth worth watching. But um, yeah, hopefully this is going to be useful to uh, to some people. So I've got seven tips um, I've compiled uh, that are in no particular order. They're just um, I've, as I've dropped them down, they're just what what came to me. So they're in a, a random list. Um, so without further ado, let's just jump in. So number one, now this is going to be the most important of the list. I said there weren't any random order, but this is actually the most important. I think this is the one I want to put first just to focus on um, because it will help your game immediately and very much. <laughs> it's going to really bump your quality of your play up quite a lot. It's just using a battle calculator. Now, until quite recently, I've not been using a calculator for, for just general play. Um, and I realized as, straight, as soon as I started using it, how effective it is in game and how really you can't if you expect to play at a decent level um you need to be using one unless you can sort of if you're a math whiz and you can just visualize everything you can just see what units are on the board and instantly just you, you know what <laughs> the percentage chance of a win is which is going to be quite hard i know i can do that given all the variations that can happen in game um so a calculator is just super useful um and yeah as i said if you if you're not using one because i I'm, I can almost guarantee the top players, platinum and probably gold standard players, will all be using calculators because it's just so effective. Um, it gives you so much information about the board as it's laid out and potential battles and, you know, what could happen in various scenarios. So if you're not using one, it's going to really put you at a huge disadvantage to someone who is because they're going to have a, access to information that you just simply can't see. Um, so planning battles, they're going to be obviously knowing the percentages going in if they're moving into a territory they're going to know the percentage chance of taking that territory but then again they're going to also know what the chances of obviously defending that territory from a counter-attack that's all information they'll have, they'll have access to which if you're not using one you won't or you know t to the same accuracy so it's going to really sharpen up your play um to no end and i think particularly for a lower level player like bronze or silver i think if you're if you start using a calculator, I'm, I guarantee it will, it will improve your games um, if you use them, you know, properly. Uh, now, the way to use them, I'd say, is pretty much for every single engagement or future engagement, you should be knowing the percentage chances of success um, on attack or defense. Um, so here's a little scenario I've just drawn up on a single player game. Um, obviously, it's uh, Russia to move here. Now this is this may be an extreme example because obviously looking at the board here, I'm, my idea of this is thinking: Can I hold West Russia? This is probably quite an extreme example because clearly, even looking at this visually, you know there's a hell of a lot of German units <laughs> nearby, um, so that would be a no-brainer to retreat because you know even with the nearby units um, that you can't hold West Russia, it's going to fall. But just double checking, um, obviously I just tab out quickly. I'll go to the calculator. So I've put this input. Now this is the one I use. This is the calculator I use. Um, it's by Jared. Mayoring. Um, it's my preferred calculator. I've looked for a few online and this is my preferred one by far simply because of how simple it is to use. It's very clean, clear. Um, it's, it's just laid out very nicely. The, the, the visual information is very, you know, um, just, just clear to understand. Um, so obviously you add your units, add the defense. You, obviously you can do sea battles as well. You can do naval, naval battles. Um, it accounts for anti-air and, you know, bombardments and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, just just make sure when obviously when you're using if, if you don't use them haven't used them before make sure you're obviously picking the people on the right sides because <laughs> that will obviously dramatically change the outcome depending on what side you put your units on but yeah so it's just very clear so i know given the battle here if i was to move all my infantry available into west russia and germany attacked with all their very available units including this fighter and tank up here as well as everything on on the, the borders west russia i know they've got a success chance of 98.5 percent which is obviously is a is a retreat for me <laughs> so i know then to pull out um but again if you wanted to do something like if say i wanted to change my mind i want to attack the ukraine um obviously we could go two and two so two artillery two infantry would have an even chance of winning that 
they've got an anti-air, so how would that affect the fight? Um, if I throw in two fighters to this battle, how would that affect the chances? And it's just this kind of thing. You want to be planning out your, your engagements ahead of time and ensuring that you always have the upper hand in any engagement you fight, in that you pick. Unless there's a reason for doing so. You know, if you're going for a capital, maybe you might want to lower your chances. But again, I think to play consistently well, I think you have to always be playing the percentages. So not taking the engagement with a bad percentage unless you absolutely have to. If you're losing, you may have to accept a lower percentage, but I think, generally speaking, you want to be obviously playing um, with the percentages in your favour. That's that's how you're going to consistently win. Okay, number two. Uh, defence profiles. And checking to make sure you've got the one you want selected. Um, now, this is a, a, probably a point I think is probably overlooked by most players. Um, if you come to Options on the main menu and go to Settings, um, on the right-hand side here, you can see Defence Profiles. Um, now obviously this, this activates when you're taking a defense from an enemy uh, where you obviously you can't manually pick your units when you're in the game you have to rely on your defense profile to pick for you um, so there's a few settings here that are worth double checking and maybe making a few profiles um, just to make sure you, you have what you want on at all times so if we just quickly just jump into one of them and um, this is my sub down profile so in this one the main difference here is my submarines, unless there's a destroyer present, will always submerge in a battle because obviously for submarines, um, they take up well, they, they attack on a um, one on defense and well, they hit on a one, sorry, on defense and they attack with a two, so it's more valuable to have them attacking rather than defending. So, as a general rule, this is my general sort of uh, default profile because it's nice to have the subs submerge whenever possible and keep them in the, in the fight still. Um, now again, you might not always want this. In some circumstances, it might be better to have the subs come up. Um, if you're, for example, in the Pacific, you have a big escalation battle between the Japanese and the Americans, and then there's a battle imminent, you may want, if you're taking a defense, you may want all of your submarines fighting, because even a few units on defending on a one is better than nothing. Um, so you may want to switch them. Now the nice thing is, you can switch defense profiles mid-game. So at the end of your round even, you could be switching multiple times in an actual one round of, of a game um, so if certain things are happening and you want to you know favor something else you can switch before your round ends and then obviously you know it'll affect the, the way the game plays for your opponent so it's worth making a few of these just to double check you've got what you want um, see so yeah, I've got a sub up and sub down just for different circumstances but yeah just double check now a good reason to do this is if I'll just quickly jump to a game this has happened to me quite a few times in gold tier on ranked the opponent has put the bombers as one of the first units to take a hit on defense which is just insanity <laughs> it's just it's it's such a gift for the Russian player because obviously for me one of the main targets or one of the main reasons to attack the Ukraine in round one is to try and kill the fighter but mainly the bomber because I have a kind of a game plan with the allies that I like to pr protect Egypt as much as I can and this bomber enables some German ideas towards Egypt so taking this out in round one for me is really valuable but if the German player has a bad defense profile and this is set to the front lines in a, in a defense that's such a gift because the, the Russian player can attack with you know s some troops destroy the bomber in one round of combat and pull out so you've lost a bomber there for very little work from the Russian player which is just a fantastic start for the Allies but again it's not great for well it's terrible for the, <laughs> the Germans so again just double check your defense profiles make sure you have the one you want selected I'd, I'd run through it as well because you can set different priorities for different units if you if you favor because me personally as well I prefer fighters in most circumstances over bombers I would rather lose a bomber than a fighter because I think fighters are more versatile. They have more, you know, uses in a game than a bomber does for me, at least. Um, so I, I tend to favour them over bombers. So I generally put the bombers lower down the list so they'll take the hits before the fighters do. Um, that's just my preference, though. But again, go through your defence profiles. I'd probably set up multiple ones and um, make sure you have the right profile for the right situation. Okay, number three, kill Germany first or KGF. Um, now, as the Allied player, when you're starting out, I, I in myself as well, I, I used to find it really hard, or I, I struggled with knowing what to do with the Allies, as in either go for Germany or go for Japan. I think it's fairly obvious if you play the few games to know that you have to focus on one of them um, to try and take one of them out of the game. If you do a sort of a, 
a mixed bag of committing to both sides, it's it's not going to go as well because the both players, both Axis nations are, are very strong, particularly Germany. So focusing down all the Allied players onto one is going to have a, a better effect for it. It's going to be more successful because you're, you know, you're going to hopefully kill that player and then you can focus back on the, the other one. Um, now it's generally in accepted within Axis and Allies this version, I think, to go for Germany first. It, it's the more explored strategy. It's more proven to work as the Allies. I think, particularly as a beginner player, um, it's the one to go for. If you're unsure which side to go, go for Germany. Now, this is not a you know, 100% rule every time. If you've had really good success in the Pacific on round one, so you went for an aggressive attack in the sea zone, beaten the fleet, you've also landed in the East Indies, taken that, uh, maybe Japan you know, went for Pearl Harbor and had a bad attack and they lost a lot of, you know, units, then it may be better go to go for Japan because they're already weak. So, you know, press that, press the attack, um, press your enemy's weaknesses. So in that circumstances, go for Japan. But as a general rule, I would say try and focus on Germany. Um, obviously, the main reason for this is your Russia is right next to Germany and it's a lot weaker. So Russia's going to need some support from their allies to survive um, because the German target really in all games pretty much is going for Russia as soon as quick you know as soon as possible and taking them out of the game as soon as possible so the Russian players are gonna need some support so a good way to do this I'm gonna explore this more in future videos because I've got an idea for some um, I want to remake my opening move videos and I made a few months ago um, and I wanted to go into more depth about my overall strategy with each nation, uh, with each side, so Axis and Allies. Um, and part of that for the Allies was going to be to discuss my attack on Germany and my techniques of, of doing it. Um, but a basic view now would be to, first of all, sweep out the legs, I'm going to call it, <laughs> of Germany, which is taking Norway, Finland, and all of the African territories. The body here, I guess you would look at it, visualise, looking top down legs either side, sweep their legs, take away their economy and support, north and south, and then you can start grinding them down in the, in the middle. Because this is IPC that can they can't easily defend. They won't have a transport normally by the end of you know beginning of round two. Um, so they can't ship things out here. Um, and similarly you can always take out this battleship and transport if they don't reinforce it by round one as Britain, if you go for it. Um, so reinforcing north and south is going to be hard. So taking away these territories early is going to be good. It's going to give you a good, a good base for then um, attacking Germany further. So I would suggest setting up transport systems between uh, Finland and Britain. Obviously, we're very close here, so get a nice convoy of transports, shipping in troops each turn, and just reinforcing these regions. Take away these two territories, and then just keep pushing towards Karelia and try and help out the Russian player. Same with the US. They're in two spaces here of Morocco. Um, so you could have two transports here, drop off troops, build two more. So when you've unloaded two down here with these two, next turn, the two you built on round one will be able to move into Morocco, and the two you had on round one moving to Morocco can move back to pick up more troops. So you get a really nice convoy of troops coming back and forth, back and forth each round. Obviously then these troops can flood down and then obviously come to reinforce Russia around in, in the Caucasus, in Moscow, or if need be in, in India. So you get a nice stream of troops from the south and the north. So as a general idea to get you started, that might be something to think about. Again, as you get, as you advance in your skills, you know, you play more games, you may develop your own techniques that you like to do, you've had some success with. But for me, if you're starting out, this is this is proven quite nice for me as the allies um, doing this kind of thing. So yeah, something to think about. But yeah, as a general rule, I would say go for Germany first. Number four. Keeping track of enemy bombers, I think, is a important point to raise. Um, I mean, personally, looking back at <laughs> my time playing the game, I know there's been numerous times when I've been surprised by an enemy bomber attacking a transport or supporting in a battle that I just hadn't seen. I didn't even realise that they were in range of, you know, this particular area. And it's quite a nasty surprise sometimes when you realise, oh crap, I just lost, what, two, three transports to a bomber that I hadn't seen. Like, damn, that's going to be super costly. <laughs> so... Um, in game I would recommend keeping track of the bombers on the enemy side at all times, knowing where they can hit, where they can't, um, 
because it will save you a lot of trouble in the long run. Because <laughs> it will avoid you getting these nasty surprises. Because really, um, it can be devastating. Because if you're calculating a battle, let's say, for maybe India, just as an example. Um, you've calculated the odds. You've done all the troops nearby, the infantry, Japan's fighters, battleships, bombardments, troops on the ground. Um, it's very even, but you've got a slight advantage. Now, if there's like two, three, even one maybe, bomber in Japan that you don't realise can actually hit India. One, two, three, four, five, six, just make sure that's right. That's right. <laughs> that could sway the battle in, in your enemy's favour, and you won't even realise that's the case. Quite considerable as well. If they had like a number of bombs, it could really turn the tide for you, and it could mean the difference between a, a victory and a loss quite easily. So just making sure you know where these bombers are, and if you've got, you know, you're accounting for them in your calculations, is going to save you a lot of trouble. I think particularly as well for me, they tend to be transport destroyers. If you have them on the coastlines as well, for like um, Germany, they're super useful to have on the coastline because they can reach so far. Particularly, if they've got some landing zones up here. If Germany still control Finland and, and Norway, it's quite interesting. They can go, if they're in France, they can go one, two, three over here. And then four, five, six land back in Finland. Um, so your transports are a lot less safe with bombers on the coastlines. <laughs> um, so I just be aware. Keep an eye on the enemy bombers. Make sure you have your transport safe, your troops safe, and you've accounted for them in any battle you might be having in the future. Um, cause it could save you a lot of trouble. Something I wanted to add as well. Um, the bombers themselves, obviously, they move on a six, which is the, the furthest range of any unit in the game. Um, when you're calculating their movement range, just make sure you have their paths correct. Because obviously, if you're picking the, obviously the not optimal route for them to go, then you're going to maybe miss how far they can actually reach. Um, so make sure you always double check that they can. you're calculating their shortest route. Um, remember as well, for beginners, you need to count them moving into a sea zone as one move. So, um, because they, they neighboured the sea here, 16, and this bomber here... Moving to the C zone would count as one move, not, you know, one down here. As in, the C zone is part of the same region, so they go one, two, three. It's one, two, three. Um, just bear that in mind. Number five, not being wasteful with your units and also protecting your high value units. Um, I was thinking about when I first started playing the game, I would routinely, <laughs> when I first started playing, um, move these two transports of the Americans, land in Morocco. And just leave the transports there. Or just, you know, I'd, I'd move there knowing that they were going to die because there was transports or, sorry, there was fighters or something near in, in France that could kill them. It's just super wasteful. <laughs> super wasteful. It would have been better for me when I first started out to wait for a round, possibly, um, build some defensive navy, and then move in. I'm waiting for one round, but then I'm keeping these two transports alive. So moving them without, def you know, a convoy, defensive units around them, this is such a waste. Um, so this applied to the entire game just try and protect all your units they're all valuable some less than others obviously but if you can avoid wasting units it's going to be far better for you in the long run because any unit you lose particularly tanks and planes um, which are obviously a lot more expensive tanks are worth 6 IPC planes are worth 10 and 12 losing these carelessly is going to really slow you down in the long term because you're having to spend valuable IPC replacing units that could have been protected beforehand. So it's really going to slow you down immensely if it keeps happening during a game and you're constantly having to resupply and re replenish those units. Um, it's going to really, really slow you down. Smarter play, more efficient and effective play. Keeping these units alive will mean you don't have to keep spending on them. You can you know, support them with more. There could be more of them on the, on the board. You could have more infantry. You could, you know... It's going to allow your IPC spends to become obviously more efficient because you're not having to replenish. So as a general rule, I think I'm still guilty of this. Um, in a very recent video, actually, I was terribly guilty of this when I moved a bomber um, into Yunnan, not looking that it was a, a British fighter here ready to move out and kill it. So I'm still guilty of doing this. But I think the main problem for me is rushing. When I rush through my games or I'm not thinking, you know, because I'm trying to get something else done or, or whatever, um, these mistakes tend to happen because I'm not looking through and double-checking my 
the situation on the board before I end my turns. Um, so this is a tip. In t this is a one of the tips in my first video actually. It's not to rush and double check things, which is it's still very applicable. <laughs> I wish to recommend it because it's going to help you to no end. But yeah, just just make sure when you're moving things around that you're not giving any units away for free, particularly the higher value units. I mean, infantry you can more it's it's more acceptable to throw them away. Um, you know, for the price of a territory, I can understand that, but again, just keep your high value units safe and don't be wasteful with um, any unit. You can obviously avoid avoid doing that. It's going to be uh, a good for you in the future. Number six, keeping an eye on your opponent's buys and mobilization phases. Now, I'm going to refer you to this um, tab down here, the war report. This is an extremely useful um, tab in the game, which is something I check every single round as every nation. Um, it's got a lot of information on here, which is just, just very useful. Just general national production for both, for, for all five nations uh, this round. Another one, IPC remaining, because in this game, obviously, if you don't spend um, in a particular round, all the IPC you don't spend will be added to your total for the next round. Um, so keeping an eye on this, as you know when you're playing the game is, is really imperative because it gives you information so for example you could see if britain was saving for a fleet or whoever was saving for a fleet if they had an enormous amount of ipc remaining um you would know that that, that wasn't their intention or if they intend to drop a big army in some locations so you can then react to that and plan for it so keeping an eye on this is going to help you out enormously in the game Obviously, it's nice to also get an overview of what's happening in the game. You can see the, the attack power for both sides, territories, so you can get a kind of an idea of who's winning the game at that given time. Um, so it's worth keeping an eye on. But also, just generally, um, purchases and mobilization. Keep an eye on what your opponents are making and deploying. Particularly, it, this, these will tie into the points made in this video. So keep an eye on bombers. Just keeping an eye, obviously, making sure you know if there's any more bombers on the map that you weren't aware of before. If they're dropping bombers. Um, again, if they drop certain units in different areas, uh, just, just make sure you know where they're deploying, where they're focusing. Um, it's going to save you a lot of hassle in the long run, knowing what your opponent's going for. It's just really trying to minimise the surprises that come your way, because really, if you're paying close attention, you shouldn't be surprised by anything your opponent does. Um, if you have all the information, if you're aware of all that's going on on the board at any given time, then there's, there's no way that they can surprise you, because you're going to be prepping and, you know, being ready for anything that they potentially could throw at you. So having that information to, in, you know, to hand is going to help you prepare better for your opponent's strategies. Okay, so my final tip for this video um, is learning from your opponents. I mean, this is, this is kind of a rule that applies to many sports, games, everything in life. <laughs> Just learning from other people, obviously, is is, is is obvious thing to say, but it's super useful. I think for this as well, this, this game, a lot of my strategy now is very little of it is what I've come up with myself. It's been more what I've seen from other people and what I've seen that, you know, work effectively against me during my games. Um, if you're getting battered in the game, it's going to obviously be annoying, <laughs> but it's going to be a great experience for you because you're going to be able to, well, make sure you pay attention to what's happening. Why are you getting battered? See what your opponent is doing. And then obviously next game, you can incorporate that into your own style. You can learn from that and apply it to yourself. Um, now, this season as well, I'm quite happy. I think I'm generally improving at the game, which is I'm glad about. Um, obviously, last season, this is last season stats. Um... 64% win rate and 47. This season, 70 and 52. So, slowly the numbers are going up, <laughs> which is good. Um, obviously, I've still got a long way to go, but I think I'm, I'm happy so far with this season's progress. Um, my goal, a personal goal for me this season was going to be to um, get to Platinum uh, as Axis. Again, the rules are different this season. Um, last season, it was a lot easier to get the Platinum. This season, it's going to be a lot harder because of the way the ranking system works. So for me, getting to Platinum this season will be really, really cool. Um, I hope I can do it. I'm pretty close, but still a bit of a grind to go. And also, my second goal was to keep um, my allied win percentage above 50%. So keep it positive, um, which I'm just about doing. <laughs> it's very close, but just about doing. So that's good. Um, and actually, I think my allied play has got a lot stronger. It may not seem like from this... Um, but my other players got a lot stronger in the last few weeks, actually, because I've been, I've been learning a few different strategies and techniques 
Um, I've been doing a bit of background reading on, you know, the game as a whole, and it's been helpful. But yeah, as I said, so just just keep an eye on everything that's happening in the game. Watch for your opponent's move. See what works well for them, as as well as obviously yourself if you're trying out something new. Um, just keep tabs on what's working well in what scenarios, and, and eventually, I imagine the top players have got a catalogue of this kind of information. For, you know, it's like chess, learning openings to to games. You know, you know what's proven to work in given situations. You know what strategy counters what opening. You know, it's it's, it's very similar to that. I think in this game, once I imagine the, the better players have got a catalogue of all the information regarding this. So, if an opponent goes for a certain opening as a nation. They'll know then what to counter with, as a general rule, uh, that's been proven to work in the past. So, yeah. Paying attention to your opponent's moves and your own, and just, you know, learning from your mistakes, learning from what went well for your opponent, um, and eventually you'll start to improve um, and start to incorporate all these different bits into your game. Um, yeah, I'll be the, the best way to improve. But anyway, I hope this has been useful for some people. Um, I'm not sure why I picked seven, because I, I have more here. <laughs> <laughs> there are a couple of more points that I could have made, but for some reason I've chosen seven as like the, the number to put up as a tip here. So possibly in the future I think I'll do a, another one as well. Um, I'll keep thinking as I'm playing. I imagine there's, there's more things that I could add into the future. I've got a couple here already I could do. Um, but yeah, I'll keep doing them, I think. I also want to mention I'm going to be doing quite soon now um, a, a redo of my opening strategy guide for each of the five nations because... I made my original one about four or five months ago, and obviously my, my play has changed a lot since then. My strategy for both sides have changed a lot. So I think it was about the right time to then redo that um, and go into a bit more depth about what I'm aiming to achieve with all the nations and then my overall ally strategy, or, or axis strategy, what, my, what I'm hoping to achieve as a team. Um, so I think going into more depth about that for each nation would be a good idea. So that's going to be coming up soon. But anyway, yeah, I hope this was useful for you. Um, yeah, feel free to give it a like and a subscribe if you've enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next video, take care